Hello and welcome to another episode of Oh What a Lovely Podcast. I'm Angus Wallace and joining me is Jessica Meyer, Chris Kempshaw and with us is Vanda Wilcox who teaches at NYU Paris and is author of, we might as well give it a plug, Morale and the Italian Army During the First World War, which I'm sure, Vanda, everyone should be rushing out to purchase. Buy two or even three copies. Are we sure people should be rushing out at the moment? Well, that's true. Perhaps you should be ordering it from Amazon uh, or, or some other online book reseller or other ones do exist. So um, now, Vanda, you have a sideline in the work of Georgette Heyer. Now, this is an odd one. Is it Heyer or Hair? How are we... Uh... Well, actually, there's a whole story about that. I usually say higher, uh, hair. She used to be higher. They actually changed their name during the First World War to make it sound less German. So I think she was higher up until the First World War, and then they changed it to hair. This makes me very happy, can I say, as a Meyer who gets mayor all the time. Um, I didn't know that story, <laughs> and I'm now feeling smug. <laughs> So there you go. But I, I think most people say Heya nowadays. That was what it looked like to me. But uh, I, just, I, was, I was reading how the pronunciation. I was interested in it itself. It's one of those things where people are shifting their names um, in reflection to the wall. Now, she's an author of historical romance and detective fiction. And we're going to be looking at how her work influences and intersects the First World War. I think for a lot of people on perhaps not a lot of people, maybe it's just me, might not be for that familiar with the work. So I think that's probably our starting point, isn't it? We need to introduce uh, Georgette Heyer uh, 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 and her work. So who is she and what's she, what's she writing about? The fact that you don't know anything about her is, and I don't want to be stereotyped, possibly because you're a man. Most of her readership are female. But if you were a reader of romance novels, you would almost certainly have heard of her. She had a writing career that spanned more than 50 years. Her first novel was published in 1921, and she was publishing right up until her death in 1974. And she pretty much invented the genre of Regency romance. The Regency period, the Napoleonic period, was the the period between 1810 and 1825 was her real specialism. But she also wrote historical romances set in the medieval period, the 18th century, Uh, What she really wanted to do was write serious historical fiction, but she had a great talent for writing light-hearted, funny, well-constructed romance, and she became an absolute mega bestseller. In the 1970s, she was selling more than a million paperbacks a year. She's an absolutely huge seller, and anyone who reads or writes romance today is indebted to her, because what we understand is the kind of genre of historical romance uh, basically comes from her. So we're centering this around the First World War. I mean, do we do we need to look at her First World War experience? I think she's too young to serve, isn't she? So where, where what's her First World War experience around her life? So she was born in 1902 into, I guess, a fairly typical middle-class family living in Wimbledon. And her father had been a French teacher He'd actually done a a classics degree, but he was teaching French. Uh, He left teaching and he ended up getting a job with a bank. And they sent him to Paris in the spring of 1914 to manage their Paris branch. So when the war broke out, the whole family were living in Paris. They'd had six very happy months there. And uh, Georgette was about to turn 12. She turned 12 on August 16th, 1914. So it's a pretty dramatic welcome into <laughs> those years and they they spent maybe the first eight weeks of the war in Paris they left in late September but she always remembered uh, hearing the guns on the Marne it was a, a really formative moment for her uh, they returned safely back to the UK but then her father volunteered and got a temporary commission he actually worked as a as a requisitioning officer and because his French was so good he ended up doing a lot of liaison work liaising with French building owners uh, getting buildings turned over for the BEF for the duration and had a couple of promotions. He was always safely well away from the lines. He was he was too old to be serving in the in the front, but basically was a uh, was a liaison officer with the French because his, his language was so good. And she wrote to him throughout the war. She was very aware of the war. She was a teenager. Uh, she was very, very close to her father. So she kind of followed his war experience. Uh, through her correspondence. And that was actually where she first developed her writing skills, was trying to write him cheerful, light-hearted, 
uh, narratives of daily life back home in Wimbledon, trying to write funny dialogue and keep his spirits up while he was over in France. Have those letters been published? They have not, actually. I don't know that many of them survive. It would be really interesting to find them. Her archives... Some of them were dispersed immediately after her death. Some of them are still in private hands. Some of them have ended up in university libraries. It's very a very confusing and disparate situation, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, that would be really great to see those letters. I presume her mother was, she's, as she's of an age, uh, a young age, her mother must have remained in, in, in Britain. Yes. So her mother stayed in Britain, but did, uh, did Red Cross work in London hospitals. Uh, and... Immediately that the war ended, she became very close friends with two slightly older women who'd both been VAD nurses. Again, I think mostly in the UK, uh, and both of whom married veterans. So her immediate social circle, which was mainly made up of people a little bit older than her, was uh, both veterans and, uh, and former nurses. So I think although she's herself a teenager for most of the war, she's acutely conscious of it. I, I'm right in saying her husband was two years older than her, so her husband when she marries, will have been old enough to have served as well. Uh, yes, that's right. But he uh, didn't serve because he had eyesight problems, uh, which which kind of bothered him. And he tried to find ways to serve in the second in some way to sort of compensate. So he had this lingering sense of having um, having missed out or having not been able to play his part. So are her first books the Regency romances? Uh, yeah. So her very first novel, she actually wrote when she was 17, so in, in 1919, to entertain her brother, who was uh, recuperating from an illness. And now that I say that, I wonder if it could possibly have been uh, the flu that he was recuperating from. I don't know. Um, anyway, so he was recovering from an illness. She wrote this story to entertain him. And then, as you do when you write a story to entertain your younger brother, she just sent it off to a publisher and it got published. <laughs> Easy. So, yeah, and that came out in 1921. So she was 19 when her first novel appeared. Uh, it's not, to be honest, very good. It's, um, it's an 18th century uh, melodrama, really. Um, it's a bit silly. It's not one of her finest works. It's called The Black Moth. It's fun, but it's, it doesn't really show the talent she had as a writer, uh, which was to be very funny. I think, I mean, the, the best thing for me about reading her is her ability to do very subtle humour, uh, almost in a kind of Woodhouse vein, her ability to write very funny dialogue. That's my favourite part. But other people love the, you know, the descriptions of the pretty dresses or whatever. There's, there's a lot to enjoy in there. But I think it's her humour which is her great strength. So if, if humour is her great strength, how, how do the novels reflect the First World War? This is kind of interesting. She never writes directly about the war in her historical novels. She has four modern novels. Most people don't know about them because she actively suppressed them. During the 1920s, she thought she might turn her hand to being a serious contemporary novelist. She wrote four uh, contemporary works. They weren't amazing, and she later suppressed them and tried to kind of eradicate them altogether. In one of them, she has a semi-autobiographical uh, character who uh, whose father enlists and she writes about the war in that. Other than that, she doesn't uh, she doesn't talk about it. Where I think she's really influenced by the war is in her own writing about war, because the period that she chooses to write about the most is the Napoleonic period, and she's deeply interested in the Napoleonic wars. And in fact, she's even really interested in battle. She's not just interested in wartime generally. She loves writing battle scenes. Her battle scene of Waterloo is epic. It's, uh, you know, a couple of hundred pages of, of detailed battle description, troop movement. When she was researching it, she drew her own maps of Waterloo so as to fully <laughs> understand what was going on. Um, and the description is so good that for a time, and this is one of her uh, great sources of delight, is actually recommended reading at Santa. Which of her novels is the Waterloo battle in? Um, this is called An, An Infamous Army. And it's set in and around Brussels, mainly. Uh, it starts basically at the beginning of the Hundred Days campaign, and it takes us through to the, the couple of days after Waterloo. And the Duke of Wellington is one of the main characters. Everything he says in the novel, basically, is taken directly from his own writings. So she combed his memoirs, published accounts of conversations with him, stuff like that. She said, I don't feel qualified to put words into Wellington's mouth. So everything he says in the novel, he did actually say at some stage, not necessarily in 1815. Um, and around that, she structures uh, a dramatic romance. But the, the military history component is 
surprising, shall we put it that way, to, to many romance readers. A lot of Hair fans find An Infamous Army quite a difficult novel, just because there's pages and pages of, you know, and on the left of, uh, of this unit is that unit, and, uh, and the artillery lined up behind, and then these guns were here, and, you know, which is not what you expect to read, perhaps, in a, in a typical romance novel. Which begs the question, how do we now protect her from Bernard Cornwell and awful men on Twitter? Right. And she's in that territory. I mean, at the time, she had male readers, right? Men don't tend to read her a great deal now, but when the novel came out, An Infamous Army was published in 1937, uh, it wasn't marketed as a romance, it wasn't marketed to women. So she depicts Waterloo in that novel, and then in 1940, and I'll come back to that publication date because it's important, she publishes another novel on the Peninsula campaign this time called The Spanish Bride. And this is the based on the true story of Harry and Joanna Smith. Oh, so fantastic. Harry Smith yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's brilliant. Harry Smith, if you don't know, goes on to have a very distinguished career. He's important at the Battle of uh, Amiral in India. He becomes the governor of the Cape Colony. And his wife, uh, Joanna, who is a Spanish aristocrat, is the Lady Smith for whom Lady Smith in South Africa is named. Um, and they meet during the Peninsula Campaign. They meet at the Siege of Badajoz in 1812, I want to say. Um and using Smith's own memoirs and a bunch of other junior officers' memoirs, she constructs this this kind of grand romance drama. So those are her two big Napoleonic War novels. But really, in all of the Regency novels, there are veterans appearing. There are uh, current or former or even aspiring officers. There are lots of subplots that revolve around the wars, around espionage, around uh, the fear of Napoleon on the continent. So the wars are a recurrent presence. And... Through her depiction of the Napoleonic Wars, she's actually deeply influenced by a lot of First World War tropes and a lot of First World War uh, cultural themes, basically through, through the 20s and 30s in particular. So my assumption is, as opposed to uh, like Jane Austen, who's writing in the period, she's imprinting current themes on the past. Yeah. That's exactly right. Hair fans, by the way, get very upset when you say this because she was very famous for the depth of her research. She was very, very research focused. She's not someone like Barbara Cartland who didn't really care. She spent days after days in the London Library. She collected enormous archives. She bought um, uh, original letters at auction to get a flavour for the slang and things like that. And she compiled uh, this almost unrivaled collection of, of detail about the minutia of life in, in early 19th century England. And because of this mania for accuracy in language, in dress, in day-to-day -day household matters, in questions about the management of the servants, all this kind of thing, her fans are very invested in this idea of her historical accuracy. So if you suggest that her depiction of the, of the wars is actually really shaped by the First World War, some people get a bit upset. But actually, I don't see this as a problem. I think it's entirely natural that in writing a historic war, she is inevitably influenced by the war that she herself lived through, but also by how the memory of that war developed in the 1920s and 1930s. There's a bunch of ways we could see it. So one way I haven't actually researched, but I'd like to look at more in the future, is actually how she depicts Wellington, because I begin to suspect that her Wellington is a little bit uh, modelled on Douglas Haig. That's interesting. <laughs> That's going to go down well. Especially given how people like to think about Haig today. So yeah. that's one of my one of my future side projects is to compare her Wellington and her the kind of image she creates. Although she uses obviously a lot of original sources, she uses all of Wellington's own words. The way that she depicts him, I think, is not uh, all that far from the 1920s and 30s portrayal of Haig. I, I was going to ask um, because because the the reading of Haig has changed so dramatically since the 1960s, particularly. Is is her Wellington quite a positive figure? Yeah, so in the late 20s to mid 30s, there's a couple of uh, big studies on Haig done, most of which are quite positive. And she's quite positive about Wellington. She started off expecting to hate him, finds to her surprise that she grows to admire him. But I think it's really the, the sort of depiction of him as a private man, the kind of aristocratic devotion to duty, a certain set of standards, a sort of understanding of what leadership is, the role of the leader kind of aloof and alone. All of those things, to me, really seem to reflect 
how Hague is being portrayed in those years. As I say, that's something I'd, I'd like to sort of dig into a bit more. But I think if you look at, at how Hague was treated, uh, you know, the reaction to Hague's death, right? Haig was hugely admired and celebrated at the time by many people. Mm. And I, I, you get a sense of that image of what a, a heroic war-winning general might be as shaping her impression of Wellington. And thinking about Haig's funeral, the, the measure that people always, that I've always read is that his was the largest state funeral since Wellington's. Right. Um, and of course, I think it's natural that you would compare Haig to Wellington, right? It, it's, it's a fairly obvious comparison. But I think in her depiction of the private man, her depiction of Wellington doesn't necessarily agree with other biographers of Wellington. So I think that as an unconscious source of what the leader might look like, I think she, she sees Haig as a, as a model. Um, and the same could be said for combat, right? So when she depicts siege warfare in particular, you read her account of the attack on Badajoz and uh, men scrambling up out of trenches over barbed wire to go to the attack uh, and uh, immediately being slaughtered as they as they charge forward. It, it could directly be uh, an account of the first day of the Somme, right? That's what it reads like. And I think that the accounts of, of First World War combat really colour how she writes a number of the combat scenes in the in the Peninsula War novel, in particular. Just just going back to Hague briefly. Sorry, I, I had a quick question because because part of what Hague was celebrated for in the twenties and thirties was the work he did for veterans. Were the you know his very personal interest in the poppy factories. The two novels you mentioned are clearly set during the war. Is there any reflection of sort of the after effects of war and and the the longer term? relationship between a, mil a great military leader and and the men who served under him we don't go very far into that where she has veterans she does deal with veterans issues but not specifically around wellington but what she is very keen on is the idea of uh beneath his gruff exterior he cares deeply about his men uh, mm -hmm. and that he, he has this you know sometimes cold off-putting appearance but he loves them and he knows them and he understands them and he knows what's best for them, uh, which is sometimes a little bit at odds if you read what Wellington has to say about his own men. <laughs> uh, let's, let's just say that the caring heart could be a bit hard to discern, but she's very keen on the idea that it's definitely there, which I think is very much a, a, a Hague uh, transplant, shall we say. So uh, other ways that we see it is, uh, is how she depicts the common soldier. There's an interesting tension between her passion for research which depicts the common soldier, uh, perhaps as he was in the um, in the Peninsula Wars in particular, um, versus the cultural tropes around common soldiers that have existed that exist during and after the First World War. So by the time we get to the to the First World War and immediately afterwards, we get a very heroic ordinary Tommy who is maybe down to earth, but he's chivalrous, he's kind, he's honourable, he's uh, you know salt of the earth character. She tries to transplant that back into the soldiers of the Peninsula War. And it's quite difficult to do because, for example, the opening scene of the Spanish Bride, you're at the Siege of Badajoz, she has to, she's faithful to the historical record, which means she goes on to describe day after day of rape and plunder and killing and atrocities that the British troops commit there, right, after the siege, uh, which isn't suppressed until Wellington goes in and hangs a bunch of them in that caring, kindly way that he yeah. obviously has. So we read all of that, but then as soon as we meet any of the individual soldiers, they exactly correspond with First World War romance novel descriptions of common soldiers, which is that even the humblest Tommy has a heart of gold. They're chivalrous, even though they speak in an uneducated way, they have an innate respect for aristocratic womanhood and its purity, they know how to behave. So there's this very strange mismatch in her uh, sort of historical soldier and then the individual characters that she creates who to me seem to be Tommies in scarlet coats. They do not seem to be Wellington's authentic soldiers. They seem to be First World War soldiers that she has transplanted into that scenario. The the romantic First World War soldier, do we have a sense of, of where she would have gotten this idea of, of the Tommy with the heart of gold? Do we, do we know what her reading was around that? Right, she's a very prolific reader um, and we know that she reads uh, and is also published in a lot of women's magazines. So if we look at the research that's been done on women's magazines during and after the war, we get a lot of these um, of these romantic 
tropes. Um, I read Carol Acton's essay, for example, mm -hmm. on uh, romance and social control in wartime magazines, which, of course, as a teenager, is precisely the age group that, that Haya would have been uh, aimed at during the war. Uh, and it, it's very much this strong emphasis on the innate manliness and chivalry of the British soldier. Uh, and this is this chivalric code in their treatment of women in particular, uh, even towards the chivalry towards the enemy, even, which again is distinctly absent in uh, a lot of the Peninsular War historical scenes. Uh, it's hard to pin down exactly what she read because tragically, after her death, her enormous library was almost immediately dispersed. What we do know of her reading habits suggest that she was reading extremely widely, including a lot of uh, contemporary women's magazines. If if her view of the war, though, is as a teenager at home with her mother as a Red Cross volunteer, is there an argument to say that her, her mother's interactions with troops will be as a woman with troops returning home? So it might well be that those men are... She sees men who are relieved to be home and gets more of that sense sense of a nice chap rather than having to be in the you know in the front line with men effing and blinding which her father might not have conveyed back to her i mean i know it's slightly slightly apocryphal story this is that my mother was a young girl during the second world war and, and, and believes to this day that people didn't swear during the second world war um which which when she announced this to my father who fought in the second world war uh, proceeded to almost spit his food across the table trying not to choke um but you know, it's a reflection of that she was young and that, that's what you know came to her so if she's um you're in her teens and her mother's interacting with troops who are relieved to be home and it's a female figure that's the war that she experiences firsthand yeah absolutely and um there's lots of nice young middle class officers junior officers who come for dinner at the family home as well um there's the nice young middle class officers that her friends marry and i think she's projecting from that very small sample size uh, as to the wider conduct not only of the officer class but of the ordinary but of the ordinary Tommy. But I think it's really about the cultural image, just how prevalent this idea that, that British Tommies might be rough and ready, but they were fundamentally good hearted. Uh, I think that becomes a very prevalent idea. And I think that's what she's picking up on. Actually, during the early 19th century, the cultural image of the British soldier is extremely negative, right? And Wellington himself describes his men as the dregs. He calls them the scum of the earth. Um, he says these are the lowest classes of British society is another typical um, description. Wellington says it's shocking to see what excesses our men commit once wet, let loose. I looked at the, the changing, a little bit of the changing image of the ordinary soldier uh, and Hugh Strawn's written about this. And he says it's really not until the second half of the 19th century that this popular image begins to uh, begins to change. And you can see, for example, in terms of attitudes to capital punishment, that during the Napoleonic era, and even corporal punishment, right? This is seen as not only essential, but positively a desirable thing to keep the ravages of, of the rabble in, in line, right? By the First World War, it becomes a much more controversial and, and delicate topic because the image of the soldier has been rehabilitated. But it, it doesn't take place until the, the second, definitely the second half of the 19th century. And I was going to say, it's, it's Kipling, isn't it? It's Tommy Atkins, you know, that and... and Plain Tales from Hills, you know, that image of the, the, the good-hearted, you know, fundamentally uh, honest British soldier who is the thin, thin red line. You know, what's the line from Tommy? Um, yeah. Simple men in barracks, most remarkable like you. This idea that, that this isn't a separate class of, of depraved individuals, but, um, but actually just part of the, the normal population. But even then, they're not necessarily seen as like, it's not a great thing to go into the army even then. I mean, the idea that, oh, you know, the soldiers aren't quite the scum of the earth, but good God, I wouldn't want to be one. Um, you know, the army still exists as, as the solution to the third son problem of, you know, first son takes over the family business, second son goes into the to the church and the third son goes into the army and hopes to die in a manner that doesn't embarrass the family. <laughs> and I think that's where, for Haya, there's a big tension because... On the one hand, she is dedicated to this accurate 
representation as much as she can of the history. And that really doesn't fit at all. Uh, her sources, her original sources, what they say is not fitting at all with this cultural image that she is fully brought into of the of the good hearted Tommy. I also think it's really interesting that she's completely uninterested in the Navy. <laughs> but again, I think that may be a, a sort of post First World War thing. If you compare to Austin, I mean, people always say, oh, Haya sort of modeled herself on Austin. Well, Austin's not interested in the army. They are not, you know, army officers are not good prospects. We have the militia and we all know they're a bit dodgy, right? In, in Austin, it's all about the Navy. Naval officers are good prospects. The Navy is, is what saves Britain. Haya doesn't care about the Navy. There's, I don't think there's a single naval officer that I'm aware of in our entire, um, our entire uh, of more than 50 novels. Um, but I, again, I think that's, that is not a Regency mentality, right? If you were writing 50 novels about your society during the Regency period, the Navy would have been a very obvious source of, you know, hero careers. Uh, and Hare's just not interested. And I think maybe the fact that the Navy just seems less interesting after the First World War. I, it did strike me as well, if you're looking for uh, historical material, um, Wellington, I think, holds those annual dinners, doesn't he, for all his ex-officers for a long, long time after the um, Waterloo. My assumption is there's a lot of literary information to draw on those, which is all very... Uh, uh, land army base rather than navy because I know Harry Sm- Harry Smith's invited to them, isn't he? Yes, um, but there must be. I haven't confessed. I haven't looked into it because, to my shame, the navy is a, is not interesting to me either. But there must be naval officers who are writing memoirs, right? I mean, Nelson. Why are we? Not, why is she not interested in Nelson and his officers? I don't know, but she isn't. She's just couldn't care less about them. Um, and I, I, that's not a contemporary sensibility to the time she's writing about. I think that's much more a 1920s and 30s sensibility that the Navy no longer seems to be the number one service. Apologies to all naval enthusiasts. We have thousands listening. Can, can I just ask, t- taking us off topic entirely, because I know Hare wrote detective novels as well. Does the First World War influence her non-Regency novels? This is a great question, and the answer is that's what I want to look at next. I haven't really Ooh. dug around in them for it. Um, it maybe is my answer, but I haven't I haven't gone to look at that yet. Oh, but what okay. I do want to talk about is gender roles in the Second World War. Yes, please. <laughs> so she publishes the Spanish Bride, which is the the Harry and Joanna Smith story, in April 1940. Uh, she had been planning it before the war broke out, but actually she writes very, very fast. She doesn't start writing the book until about October, November 1939. So it's entirely written after the Second World War has broken out, but before any major stuff has really happened. So it's written during the phony war. And I think what we have is a very interesting, is it a dialogue? I don't know, intersection between three different wars. It's a Second World War novel written about the Peninsula Wars, but strongly influenced, I think, by what happened during the First World War. Because one thing that you could argue that the Spanish Bride tries to do is it sets out a model for gender roles in wartime. So by discussing how Harry and Joanna manage their marriage and their conduct in the Peninsula War, Haya provides a blueprint for what you ought to be doing in the Second World War, which is about to get going, based on British experiences, British cultural anxieties from the First World War. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. The first thing that <laughs> happens is in the novel is that they get married. So they meet, they're instantly attracted to each other on the battlefield. Uh, Joanna, incidentally, is 14 years old, so this is a little bit off-putting to the modern reader, which is another problem in terms of it being a romance novel, right? And they get married. Within, like, 20 pages of the novel beginning, there they are, this fully adult British officer and a 14-year-old Spanish girl who speaks no English. It's not very promising material for romance, um, you might think. But actually, the way that Haya presents this uh, is very much about what do you do in wartime? You have this heightened climate of uh, tension, emotional excitement, uh, sexual attraction. It's a way of addressing the khaki fever problem, right? What do you do when you have this this encounter and he's about to be swept off to war? Well, you get married. Uh, it's a it's a drumhead marriage. It has its own romance, but it's the idea that that marriage is a solution here rather than 
extramarital sexual behaviour. Uh, Heya is deeply conservative, incredibly traditionalist. And the way she writes about the encounter between Harry and Joanna is very much setting forward the, the correct way to, to cope with these kinds of encounters that war might bring. But then, whereas in reality, this kind of uh, wartime hasty marriage is then going to lead to separation. What the Spanish Bride does is it gives you a fantasy that you could follow your man to war. So obviously in 1940, as you read this and you go through your hasty wartime marriage, you know you're going to stay home while your husband goes off to war. But you can follow him in your imagination. And Joanna follows Harry onto the battlefield. She follows him throughout the entire campaign, not literally into battle, but she follows him throughout his entire campaign. She's wholly self-sacrificing. She's obsessed with his duty. She always puts the army and its needs first. She knows that uh, whatever her needs and emotions are, they have to be uh, sacrificed to Harry's needs, Harry's emotions, and above all, his, his military duty. So it's a very explicit model of correct wartime behavior for the wife. And she gets her reward because he's also loving and devoted, but his, his duty has to come first. So it's this model of um, patriotic sacrifice. And uh, again, we can really see this in the First World War. Nicoletta Gulache has written about this. Women's patriotic sacrifice is sending men off to do battle. You see it in a lot of the, pro the wartime recruitment posters, I think, from the First World War. You know, women of Britain say mm. go. What do you do as a, as a dutiful woman? You can't go onto the battlefield, but by sending your husband off or your lover off or your fiance or whatever, and by ensuring that he does his duty wholeheartedly, you're doing your bit for the war effort. So to get that message so strongly in this 1940 novel, I think is really interesting. It's reflecting those First World War tropes, but channeling them through the, the fictional construct of the Peninsula War. It's interesting what you were saying earlier about, about Hayer's reading of women's magazines, because it's Jane Potter's book on women's magazines that talk about, you know, that trope of young women wanting to serve and how they could channel their service in appropriate ways and and teaching, you know, the, the role of these women's magazines in teaching them how to act appropriately through romance stories that, that Potter talks about quite extensively. Um, and I think she has some examples of historical fiction being mobilised in similar ways, which is quite an interesting way, way of doing it. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very much that idea that that you could be keen to serve and that your service would take this specific supportive role. So Joanna, you know, learns to mend socks and cook stew and whatever um, and do her wifely duties. But in doing so, she's not just performing a domestic role. She's actually performing a, a, a kind of quasi-public patriotic role in, in enabling and supporting Harry and eventually all of his friends. Uh, she mends everybody's socks, right? That's how good a wife she is. <laughs> what a hero. Uh, but that's, that's, that's very clearly women's patriotic duty in wartime. And uh, even at Waterloo, so the end of the novel, it, most of the novel is around the Peninsula campaign. At the end of the novel, they go off to Waterloo and she refuses to be left behind. But she knows what her duty is. It's to do the supportive behind the scenes role, to darn the shirts and then to do the nursing and so on that might be required afterwards. So there's, uh, I think, a very clear kind of didactic message but and this i think might be interesting for you jessica is that there's also um, a kind of model of successful masculinity that mm. harry is a good soldier he never neglects his duty he's very much the model of successful martial masculinity but mm. he's also focused on his domestic duties yeah it's interesting because um Graham Dawson, one of his soldier heroes is Henry Havelock, who's celebrated for his uxoriousness, for, for his devoted yeah. relationship to his wife. But the basis of that is the distance between them, that he's in India and she's in, back in Britain. Um, and of course, he dies out in <laughs> India. So there's a, there's a longer late 19th century tra tradition, I think, of the soldier hero as husband um, that yeah. certainly gets mobilized during the First World War. But actually, the, the comparison that I'm finding quite interesting with this is another novel that was published, I think it's 1940 or 1941, I can't remember, that was also written very quickly, which is Marjorie Allingham's Traitor's Purse, which is one of my all-time favorite novels. And like you with, with Hayer and Detective Fiction, I need to write more about this at some point. But it's about the relationship between Albert Campion and Amanda Fitton and the fact that he forgets her. But she's much younger than he is. And he's, he's a wartime spy, I think, in both 
both wars is the implication. He he doesn't appear to have any sort of military service, but he 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 has a spying role certainly in the Second World War, and and the implication is he he did something similar in the First World War, um, based on his age profile. Uh, so I'm now going to have to go away and read the Spanish Bride so I can do a comparison with Trader's Purse. I think is is my conclusion from this. I think it will be very interesting because it it really fits with your uh, with your interest in in how those different forms of of masculine obligation and identity are are managed and and the way it's presented is that it's actually quite difficult for harry at times but it's his priority is precisely that task of of integrating his military and his domestic duties how much does she write from his perspective versus her perspective i mean she she takes on a a male voice i take it here in, in her writing uh it's all third person she she uses harry's uh, diaries, and sometimes you can even find um, published memoirs. You can even find, you know, direct bits of dialogue and so on that she's lifted. Um, but we primarily see things from from Joanna's perspective. But we see through her eyes even how how stressful it sometimes is for him managing these obligations because she's following him to the very verge of the battlefield. And sometimes there's a storm and it's two in the morning and the French artillery comes up and she's still there milling around in the middle of the unit. And he's an officer, so he's responsible for his men and he ought to be in charge of them. He's got this 14-year-old girl in tow uh, and her servant and some greyhounds. Uh, And clearly it's not ideal, but the didactic part comes in very clearly that, uh, you know, everyone predicts oh, you know, his marriage is going to destroy his ability to be a good officer. But she is adamant that, no, she's going to make him an even better officer than he would have been if he'd stayed single. So she's endlessly self-sacrificing and she's keen to get out of the way and do whatever else she can do. Even when she gets an injury, she bravely grits her teeth because that's what a good soldier does and she never lets anybody see that she's in pain and this kind of thing. What I wanted to ask in and amongst this was uh, it was about you uh, and your interaction with it vanda so where does the where does your geeky love of this come from was it did, did, did you work on a higher and then kind of fall in love with it or is it like a, a a geeky kind of pursuit that then turned into work what's what's the what's the what's the map well um very coincidentally, just as it was my mother taking me to first world war battlefields that made me fall in love with the First World War, if that doesn't sound creepy. Um, when I was about 12 or 13, my mother gave me my first George at Hare novel, which is uh, These Old Shades, which is a, a kind of mid-18th century uh, French mistaken identity farce, basically. And I fell in love with it, and I'd read them all through my teenage years. And very interestingly, a number of other women First World War historians that I've spoken to have said, oh, I used to read George Hare as a teenager too, but kind of like confessing a guilty secret because it's romance <laughs> and intelligent people aren't supposed to read romance, apparently. Um, but anyway, so I'd always loved her. She'd always been my escapism. Uh, I'm a member of a, a George Hare group on Facebook. I've got them all. For many years, my mum used to say that she had a dream that she one day found a new hair that she'd never read. And I knew I'd really grown and up about five years ago, I had that dream too. I dreamt very vividly <laughs> finding an unread Georgia Hare. And it was this pure joy. Because although she's written 55 novels, I've read them all. Even the really quite boring medieval ones. And I know them all pretty well. And I never really thought about working on it until I saw a call for papers for a conference in 2018 in London about Hare. And I have to say, Chris and Jess, you two were actually my inspirations to think maybe I can work on this because you both are people who've can pursued geeky passions, basically. So sorry. And I thought, right, I'm going to do it. And uh, I've been brooding about how she depicts the war and the fact that for someone who's really writing romances, she loves war and she loves battle, which I think is quite unusual. I mean, even her depiction um, in the otherwise very mediocre novel, The Conqueror, she does a depiction of the Battle of Hastings, which is fantastic uh, and quite gruesome. So uh, the more I was thinking about these depictions of war, the more I began thinking, oh, that reminds me of a, of a First World War trope. And I thought, ha ha. Now that you're working on it, has it changed the way that you look at the books now? Do, they, do, do you still read them for pleasure or does it feel like work? 
Um, oh, no, it couldn't feel like work. I think you should go away and read a little hair right now and see if it could possibly feel like work. <laughs> <laughs> but I do find myself spotting things. So, for example, there's a probably my favourite of her novels has a character who is a, a disabled veteran. And I've been thinking, oh, this is really interesting. I start to spot more and more things that I hadn't, or think about things in ways I hadn't thought about them before. Uh, you know, just, just how veterans are depicted, how military service is depicted. What does it mean to, to take on a, a career as an officer? There's some people for whom that's an escape and uh, a path to freedom and a path out of boring respectability. But there's other people for whom that's a redemptive choice. And, you know, they're, they're wastrels, they're feckless, they're worthless young men who become redeemed by life in the military. And I'm starting to think about these as, as cultural tropes around military service that might be interesting to write about so uh, it hasn't stopped me enjoying it has it influenced your more academic work does it feed into your readings of the italian army in the first world war that's a great question it's made me want to read more popular fiction from the italian side which i haven't done a lot of i've read a couple of wartime popular novels including the first ever Italian bestseller, which was published in 1915 and is a kind of romance novel. Um, it's the first novel to sell more than 100,000 copies in Italian, and it's called Mimi Bluet, and it's a romance about a, a kind of mm, nightclub dancer, which is very interesting in terms of what it says about wartime romance in Italy. But it's made me want to go and read some, some 90s and 1920s and 30s novels and see what the relationships are. This also made me want to go and do more stuff about detective novels that I have an, some ideas about death in war and death in the detective novel that I want to explore more as well. You might have come to the right place. I was, I, I was just about to say, same here. I, I, you know, vi violence and death in the detective novel is, is where I'm going. So. If, if, if it wasn't enough to be thinking about real death, we're also going to think about fictional death, right? Right. <laughs> I feel like there's, there's more for me to dig around in. Uh, at this stage, I'm not, I'm not doing archival stuff. I'm really just reading the novels and the, the relatively limited amount of secondary work that's been written about Haya. She's not been written about a lot, I guess, because as a romance novelist, until relatively recently, uh, she was not taken seriously by scholars as a worthy subject of, of study. Although, interestingly, one of the first serious critical pieces about her was actually written by A.S. Byatt in 1970, I think. So there have always been intelligent readers interested in her, uh, but there's a relatively limited amount of scholarship on her as yet. But yeah, I, going forward, I would love to get hold of more of what she was actually reading, because I think that would be really illuminating here. But you have published something on her, haven't you? Um, mm. It's forthcoming. So the conference proceedings from the 2018 conference should be out later this year with UCL Press in a volume edited by uh, Kim Wilkins and Samantha Rayner, and it should be open access, which is very exciting. I think it will right. be called The Non Such, Georgette Hare and Her Historical Contemporaries. We'll, we'll make sure that's in the um, show notes um, and hopefully have a link eventually once that's out. I'm intrigued about the uh, Battle of Waterloo. I'm, I'm quite fan I, I've quite fancied reading, re re be really interesting to read a, 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 a romance fiction about the Battle of Waterloo with pages and pages of battle description it's really well done i think it's i think it's fantastic and it's even people so in the georgia hair group on facebook even people who have no interest in military history at all often find themselves enjoying it much more than they expect which i think is a great testament to her skill as a writer really could we sell it from an advertising perspective as uh, rather than like uh, sharp is uh, war with romance this is romance with war yes i think that's very fair <laughs> and uh uh, An Infamous Army, which is, is the Waterloo novel, uh, also has a lot to say about gender roles in wartime in the opposite direction. So where the Spanish bride presents a sort of model of virtuous womanly behaviour in war, uh, in An Infamous Army, we see the counter model. We see basically a kind of flapper type, uh, frivolous, uh, vain, empty headed woman who's all about the dancing and the fashion and who causes a lot of scandal. She's a sort of archetypal bright young thing. Um, she scandalously wears makeup and other such disgraceful aberrations. <laughs> C.S. Lewis is going to hate her. <laughs> it's, it's outrageous stuff. So she's the sort of what not to do in wartime, and she's bored by the idea of duty, and she tries to seduce devoted officers away from their task and so on. 
But it's okay. There is redemptive service in wartime. She ends up uh, volunteering as a kind of, uh, as a basically a proto VAD nurse. She's like a sort of um, an 1815 uh, uh, version of the VAD. And through her nursing service, she is eventually redeemed and becomes a worthy romance heroine in the end. So we also get this this counter model of of gender in wartime in an infamous army. Now that I have to read, I need nursing as redemption is uh, is something I'm <laughs> particularly interested in at the moment. So yes, I will I will go away and look for her. And also camaraderie. So two women who don't get on at all uh, go out into the streets of Brussels. They nurse the wounded soldiers, and through the mutual experience of that brutal experience they grow close together and they forge an indissoluble bond which again is such a first world war cultural trope Mm -hmm. uh the sort of comradeship of suffering so yeah go forth and read georgia hair that that's that sounds like a really good place to to end this i think we're all 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 of her books are still in print uh, new editions are published every year. That's how popular she is. The, the, I suspect, by the sounds of it, the only thing that almost lets them down is the almost formulaic uh, romance covers. Try, try if you can to get one of the old 60s editions with the pan covers, because I think they're the nicest. The modern covers are awful. Really dreadful. Very Mills and Boone. Right, really depressing. Go and look online and find yourself some nice vintage ones with the 60s pan covers. That's much better. Or even the original... Um, uh, covers his, her favourite illustrator was a guy called Barbosa, and he did some very elegant, restrained covers in the 30s and 40s. That's what you really want to look out for. But if you get into collecting the first editions, be warned, then it starts to get expensive. Dreaming about expensive books. Shall we? Shall we? Uh, <laughs> shall we leave it there? What? What are we? What are we talking about next time, Chris? What have you got lined up for us next time? Um, that's an excellent question, Angus. Um, I'm hoping that we are going to be talking to Julia Ribeiro Thomas about um, her interaction with uh, popular culture in the First World War. And I think it might end up being um, heavy metal music and death metal music um, and the First World War. I suspect that's the direction it's going to go in. That is a bit of a change of tone from today. <laughs> it, and it, it's one uh, yesterday got me thinking, and I, I'm increasing a, a long list of, of songs from my youth that after thinking about them, I've suddenly gone, First World War, First World War. So you get Metallica's one, which is it all about uh, you know a, a guy with his arms and legs blown off and he can't see, can't hear uh, as a First World War casualty. Well, that's going to be uplifting for us. <laughs> Body horror, it's all in there. And it really got me thinking of, of, uh, of, of tunes that I seem to remember from my, from my youth. So I think, I think that would be very interesting. I think the moral <laughs> of the story is that almost everything is about the First World War, if only you look hard enough. This, this, is, this is the basis of this podcast, if you haven't worked that one out. <laughs> <laughs> in fact, is there a way to put that as our tagline? Everything comes back to the First World War. Well, thank you, Vanda. That was fabulous. Um, really good talking to you. That was great. Thank you, Vanda. Thank you very much. And I guess uh, I guess we'll uh, we'll talk First World War, First World War and heavy metal, hopefully, next time out. Oh, 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 it's a lovely war. Richard, how can we spend the Bolivian? Oh, 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 it's a lovely war.